Hello, boomers. I'm Hannah. <laughs> I'm Melissa. And today we have a very special treat for you. In honor of World Mental Health Day, Hannah and I recorded a special episode where we interviewed some friends at Stanford and also uh, friends around the world and talked about mental health in grad school and some of the challenges that we face and, and really got some amazing stories from people on how they overcame these challenges and, and how their mental health was affected. So we're really excited to share these with you. Yeah, and one of the important lessons that we learned from our friends who shared was just that every feeling is valid and that it's always useful to seek help. And sometimes the first help that you seek might not work out the way you want it to, but to really keep trying and persevering through that. And we're lucky enough that a lot of universities that we're in as graduate students have the resources and you might have to dig a little bit, but really try to find help, um, even if it's just from a mentor or fellow student. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sometimes it's as simple as reaching out to a friend or another student. But yeah, we definitely have to be aware of times that uh, we may need to seek help outside of that as well. Biomechanics off our minds, mental health on our minds. Hey Boomers, we are here today with our friend Francis, who is a third year PhD student in the stem cell program here at Stanford. And we're really happy he's come here to tell us today about um, his experience with mental health at, here at Stanford and as a graduate student. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, yeah, super thanks jazzed. for being here. Yeah. So can you tell us about a time um, that you maybe struggled with mental health or it played a big role in your life? Oh my God, I hope this podcast is like four hours long because <laughs> I, have, I have a lot to say. All right. Um, so I guess most recently, my mental health struggle started um, when I arrived at graduate school. So that was probably about two and a half years ago when I arrived at Stanford. Um, I, for a long time, had not really known what I wanted to do with my life and kind of had a vague idea that I was probably going to be like... If I was going to be involved in science, then becoming a scientist would be the logical thing to do. So I right. applied to graduate school. Didn't think I'd get into Stanford. The universe yeah, was like, hello. Same. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, uh oh, well, now I have to go. So I so I got here and I thought to myself, you know, if I'm going to be happy in science in graduate school, what better place than Stanford? You know, it's sunny California, there's great people here, lots of money or whatever. You know, the I in terms of at least what I viewed was the graduate school game. I like won, whatever that means, right? right. So I got here and I was um, uh, sincerely disappointed knowing that as I went through classes and as I went through rotations and the grad school sort of dance, that I was not happy. I was completely unhappy um, coming to class every day. I was completely ha unhappy going to lab, even though on the surface, I, you know, when, people, when mom and dad would call, my friends would call, hey, how's the graduate school going? You're like, oh, my gosh, I'm so inspired every moment. And, like, you know, my best right. self is here all the time. Um, <laughs> and that is, I mean, there's, I don't have anything against Stanford. There, I found many aspects of graduate school good but and wonderful even. But overall, I was really, really unhappy because I felt like I was stuck, that I had made this decision. I had locked myself in to a particular path that my life was going down, and I didn't want it to go down that path. Uh, but because right. I had spent so long preparing and studying and working hard um i felt like it was ridiculous for me to either turn back or see what else is out there because i had just i've just been in it for so long i didn't want to waste time right. so i just got to keep pushing on so I, I i told myself okay you know maybe when i finish classes things will get better or maybe when i find my lab things will get better um, and every time i increased that milestone forward it didn't get better and uh that was really really hard and probably and, and about two years after i arrived here at stanford i really thought that life was no longer worth living so i got to the point this was now i guess april of this year um mm -hmm. where things were getting really really bad i started canceling all my social engagements i just was not seeing people yeah. anymore i was I felt like I was coming to work with almost no energy and 
as we all know, science sucks the life out of you. So I would get all my energy, you know, sucked out of me and I would come home drained. And that yeah. process would rinse and repeat every, every, every single day. And one day um, I did not go to lab. I didn't go to class because mm-hmm. I knew or I, I, I did know that I was going to end my life that day. That, that was the day, everything, it was, it was not worth it anymore. I had made plans. I knew exactly how I was going to do it. And thankfully, my wonderful partner, Alexa, intervened. She talked and asked, you know, do you think it'd be good to talk to somebody? So she called the uh, the crisis hotline mm-hmm. So at Stanford at Student Health. There's a 24-hour hotline staffed by psycholo- uh, psychologists and therapists. Uh, we called the hotline. I talked to the lady on the phone. Um, and she said, you know, I think it's really best if we get you to the hospital. Yeah. So uh, Alexa took me to the emergency room. I was um, assessed there and was brought to the psychiatry ward at Stanford. Unit G2P represent. Uh, is, is, <laughs> is, the, uh, uh, is the open ward. Um, and I spent six days in a psychiatry ward. Um, I spent six days in the hospital. Um, and that was probably the, the lowest point of my entire life. It was really difficult knowing that because, you know, as a graduate student, I work next to the hospital. The, the idea that I was yeah. here getting my PhD at the School of Medicine, and now I'm in the, the hospital as a patient in a place that was I never thought I would end up with. You know, I mm-hmm. think, no, you know, pe- most people who end up in the psychiatry ward, I think, don't hope or predict that they will <laughs> at some point, yeah. you know. Um, so, yeah, so I spent six, six days in the psychiatry ward where all, all sorts of things happened. Um, not to make the podcast last too long, but I, during, during, during that time, um, I was assigned to a psychiatrist. I had a social worker. I had a, a therapist. I had uh, all sorts of people. I lost track of how many people. They literally had yeah. to write my providers on a whiteboard in front of my bed because I was like, I couldn't remember all of them. It was crazy. Yeah. Um, uh, they started me on medication. I had never been on medication before, so that was also a new experience. Um, right. And it gave me a lot of time by myself, which is good and bad. You know, I was immediately yeah. removed from school basically i kind of hit the i hit the red button everything was paused um but i spent a lot of time in that hospital but thinking holy crap like how did i get here can i get out of here should i get out of here um there was a lot going through my head it was a really really difficult time especially as you know i'm starting medication i'm meeting all these new doctors and I'm worrying about mm-hmm. what's going to happen with school, you know, what's going to happen with my or boss. Like added stresses on top Yeah, of yeah. Um, so thankfully in the hospital, the day after I arrived, um, my dean, the graduate dean, came to me and said, listen, we're going to, like, don't worry about school. My job here is to make sure school is taken care of. You need to focus mm-hmm. on recovery right now. Because my stresses were like, I need to email the professors. I need to email my TA. Like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to be late on my assignment because, you know, I'm yeah. cr- clinically depressed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah. um, but like my immediate reaction was I need to, because I'm a graduate student, like I would need to like take care of all the crap that right. I'm leaving because right. I can't just yeah. let my experiments go on. Like I've got cells to feed. I've got, you know, papers to write. Yeah. You don't have time to, you know. <laughs> I don't have time to be sad. <laughs> yeah. I don't have time to be sad. Like, you know, there's no time to be sad. So I was like, oh my gosh, like I have all these things to worry about. And they were like, don't worry about it. You need mm-hmm. to focus on you, which is like, the, it was very important. Mm-hmm. Um, so I basically spent six six days in, in the hospital, which was a time where basically they wanted to make sure that the crisis had passed, that I wasn't acutely wanting to end my life. We could approach things in a more, I don't want to say sensible, but um, less high octane environment. Right. Yeah. Right? Um, so after I left the hospital, I started three months of therapy which is a lot different than three months of lab work. Um, so I was I spent three months in therapy five days a week, wow. uh, 20, 25 hours a week wow. in therapy, wow. which is a lot of time to think yeah. about yourself. I told Was my, it individual therapy or group therapy? That's or a, yeah, so the program that I was in was basically designed to be a stepping stone out of the hospital because yeah. it, it is quite jarring to sort of be in the hospital having all your mental health needs addressed and then all of a sudden being thrust out into lab work again or yeah, real life and like, yeah, oh my God, imagine. you know, whiplash. So it was sort of a step down. So it was a combination of a lot of things. I had an individual therapist, mm-hmm. I had a psychiatrist to manage mm-hmm. my medication and the rest of the day was group therapy. 
um, focused on like different kinds of topics. I like to think of it like summer camp, right? So you have, we had the board, the whiteboard with all the activities for the day <laughs> and you could pick, but instead of like archery and canoeing, it was like crisis management and like anxiety <laughs> reduction. And things like that. Like, oh my gosh, there's a session on validation today. I'm going to go to that. Um, uh, so, and that's how it went for three months. I, I spent all, all my time at my group therapy program um, and um, that was a change because I hadn't really done therapy beforehand. Mm -hmm. So I went from zero to like a hundred, like very, very yeah, like quickly. <laughs> I told my therapist during the first two weeks, I was like, Brenna, I think I'm going to have more problems when I come out of this program. But when I started with like, I'm spending so much time thinking about yeah. myself. Right. Yeah. And like as students and graduate students, our lives are going at 150 miles an hour. Yeah. You don't have, you don't often get the opportunity to really sit down and think, like, am I happy? Yeah, never. Like, very basic questions, like, where's my life going? You know, am I am I jazzed about what's going to come in the next month, year? Yeah. Um, and so I spent three months sort of looking at those questions, um, and I've since ended that. Um, now I see a private psychiatrist who is also my therapist. Very convenient. Two birds and one stone. Highly recommend. Uh, it's, good. it's good. It's good for the schedule. <laughs> always about efficiency. It's always about efficiency. Um and yeah, that's sort of where I am at today. So that was, uh, those were the things I went through in terms of like structure, mental mm -hmm. health wise. Yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. And is there like, in kind of talking just your last point of going zero to a hundred. Yeah. Like, do you have any thoughts on like, if you had done something earlier or were there signs that you should have done something earlier or things like that? You. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think like the biggest point and the biggest thing that I've learned out of all of this is that what you are going through mentally doesn't have to be a crisis for it to be valid. Yeah. It doesn't have to become a crisis to be legitimate. I, I think oftentimes, especially as graduate students, we are often invalidating our own emotions and we get invalidating messages from other people about our own emotions. Oh, you know, you shouldn't feel sad. You've got other things to worry about. You're in graduate school. You're not homeless and, and poor on the street. Like, why are you sad? Yeah. Why are you unhappy? Yeah. You have nothing to be unhappy about. Yeah. Um, and the biggest thing is if you're upset, if you're sad, then you're upset and you're sad and it is nobody's right to tell you otherwise. Right. So mm -hmm. if you get those initial signs, you are unsatisfied with something, you're unhappy, you don't have to wait for it to escalate to the point where you think that it's become a legitimate problem. Mm -hmm. You know, mental yeah. health is something that you need to worry about or address very early on. Um, and quite frankly, even if you feel like you don't really have a lot to talk about with a therapist, I would honestly just recommend seeing somebody just to talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know the first time I met with my therapist, I'm like, what are we going to talk about? Like, I, I got it. Like, I know yeah. I was in the hospital, but I got it. It's fine. And then I like cried for an hour. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to come back with to you. Next <laughs> yeah. Okay, you're right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And like, sometimes you just don't know. And yeah. so even if you don't think that you've got enough going on to warrant making an appointment and going to a doctor, you know, cause sometimes like, you know, with, yeah. with physical stuff, you're like, just walk it off. Like it's fine. It'll, re it'll resolve. Yeah. yeah. Um, but oftentimes, especially in your, if you're in a high pressure situation in life, things are not going to get easier yeah. as time goes on. So yeah. even if you just see somebody and just yeah. talk, even if you don't have an agenda, just go right. and talk to yeah. somebody. So where do you feel like it's going to go from here? I think, when you're saying, you know, take the time to ask yourself, are you happy? Like, I actually, I ask myself those questions mm, a lot. Like mm -hmm. sometimes I think almost too frequently and I don't always like the answer to it. And, right. and sometimes I'm like, well, am I just upset because, you know, this project isn't going well? Yeah. Am I going upset because I'm not happy where I am? Yeah. Or like, should I be doing something completely different? And yeah. I feel like a lot of times it's hard to differentiate those types of feelings. And I was just wondering yeah, the kind of effect that this experience has had on you and, and looking forward, what changes mm -hmm. you see it yeah. having in your life. Yeah, um, a lot of changes. And I think that's part of the reason why I didn't want to address the problem is because I was afraid what the answer would be. Yeah. You know, if I have this sort of overarching sense that I'm not happy, doesn't mean I shouldn't be here. But I spent all this time wanting to be here, you know, like yeah. that doesn't, that wouldn't be right to me. Yeah. Um, the most salient and difficult lesson that I learned over the course of a whole bunch of therapy, shout out to Cardinal Care Health and Insurance, <laughs> <laughs> is that it, a common thing we used to say in group therapy is that you need to put on your own oxygen mask before helping others. And what yeah. that means Whoa. is that 
it's not selfish to want to take care of yourself because if you do not take care of yourself, you will not be in a position to help others. Right. And so for me, putting my own needs first, putting my own emotions into the forefront, I felt selfish. Like I shouldn't be worrying about this sort of thing. I shouldn't worry about, you know, there's so many other problems. Humanity needs my science. You know, who am I to be upset? Like there's so many people, (laughs) which is like, I think a lot of people think like, you know, think that way. Right. Um, So after I was in therapy and after I was in the hospital, I said, you know, gosh, I, maybe some things are not going where I want them to be going <laughs> in yeah. my life. And I, and I took a hard look at where things are going and I made some difficult decisions. And I, I went to my advisor and I will come out and say that this is very much a very privileged conversation I've had. Like not many people are open to go to their advisor and just talk it out. I went mm-hmm. to the director of my program and I said, um, I, this is where I think my life is going. And I want it not to go there. If I can't fix all these things that I've been going through, I have to leave. Yeah. I was, I, I have to leave. I cannot be here anymore. Um, I sort of swallowed the idea that maybe this isn't right for me. And, you know, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be right for you. You know, there is no metric of success that you have to achieve before you can go on and do what you actually want. Yeah. In my opinion, yeah. you know, you have done, and I'm sure everyone listening has done so much in their lives to be proud of. And in my personal life, I, it's always the next thing. Like, you know, oh, I'm at Stanford Shore, but I need to get my PhD. And then I'm going to do a postdoc at Harvard. And then I'm going to be a professor mm-hmm. somewhere or whatever. There's always that next thing. Um, to take the step back and think, you know, maybe I don't want to go that way. It's mm-hmm. really difficult. Yeah. It's really difficult. Yeah, It's difficult to tell people who have looked at you for your whole life as the person who's going to do X, Y, and Z, you know, I always got Francis is going to cure cancer and do this and do that. And to like tell people for once, like, you know, maybe that's not what I want to do with my life is really difficult. Um, So now I look at, I I can't say all, I say most of the decisions that I'm making on a day-to-day basis. And what I think to myself first is what do I want to do? Yeah. Which is such an easy thing that we always overlook. What do I actually want to do? Not what your program wants you to do, not what your PI wants you to do. What do you actually want to do? Mm-hmm. So I told my advisor that. And thankfully, we have sort of retooled what I'll be looking at in graduate school to better align with what I actually want to do with my life. Mm-hmm. And what my current advisor told me when I met with him and was being very real with him is that you need to have a dream. In graduate school you know you need to there is has to be some goal some yeah. lighthouse some candle yeah. in the distance that you are working towards because otherwise you get lost and that's where i was i didn't have that dream i didn't yeah. have that oh it's going to be worth it when i get to this i didn't know what that was and because of that i felt like i was working so hard for seemingly nothing and i didn't know where i was going yeah um i forget the original question but now i look no. at life as like what putting your needs first and what do i actually want to do we really appreciate you sharing your story with us. My pleasure. And yeah. that was, I'm inspired. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can be too. So eventually, yeah. <laughs> thanks for inviting me on. It was a blast. Thank you, Christian, for talking with us. Christian is from Chile and he's just moved to Australia only one week ago to start his PhD. Uh, why have you decided to go to Australia for your PhD? Yeah, well, Melita, thank you for your interview. Well, um, well, Melissa, in my case, this was an idea within the concept of the family project that established a new competence and expand the sense of trying to find a big benefit for my family members. For example, uh, for my oldest son, uh, I can give uh, the opportunity to uh, stay to be able to access the uh, high education and learn a second language and to access another culture. And for example, for my wife, it's too uh, big an opportunity uh, because uh, she is, is, for she's very hard to try to find English in our country. And that's why I wish she's uh, studying in Australia. In addition, for example, it's very interesting to uh, try to share, interchange uh, some different culture. That's why I choose studying PhD in Australia. What has it been like to go through this having a family? Uh, well, uh, for us, hard, it was hard because since you must apply, for example, for the visas or 
to try to buy the insurance fields and try to enroll your son to the high school are some challenges you try to must confront. Does your son know English? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it, the, the English language for us is very complex because in our country, um, only you speak in Spanish and you try to find some the second language in English, it's very hard to try to learn. What are some challenges that you face teaching and going to school in Chile that students in other places might not face? Yeah, well, the central problem of the education in Chile is related with the not preparing to know English, the second language, which implies that you must invest money and time to solve the problem, which is time in order to be challenged. That is the main problem in our country. Uh, when do you want to take a problem, which is the problem in another country, when the main language is English, you uh, will be confronted with two problems, the big problem, the language, and after that, try to involve a, a different culture. That's why uh, I recently tried to start a PhD program here in Australia. English yeah, is different if you compare with an American language. And another time to understand the different culture. I, I think you know, for my family, my wife, for example, to, and my sons, I think it, for them will be very, very challenging. But, uh, that's my point of view in this question. Yeah, thank you for the insight. Um, what do you think has helped you overcome some of these challenges, and what would you recommend to a student in a similar position? Well, uh, First, I think um, if you want to study in another country, you must try to obtain the full information yourself of the steps necessary to achieve the symptoms of the university where you wish to study. That is the first one. To reach out to the university that you want to study at? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, right now, I'm studying in UQ. Um, my personal experience was very hard trying to time, all the requirements. I think uh, another uh, very important uh, situation to try to control is the financial support. That why try to do the PhD in the country is very expensive. And in my case, I obtained a scholarship in government uh, that helped me try to support the financial or the spend here in Australia. Another fun uh, fundamental thing is to be systematic, orderly, and obtain some money to start to paperwork before traveling to country where we. I think that is the main important point to take to control when you want to study in your country or a PhD. Well, in conclusion, for us is a very big challenge that is linked to a family project. We are very happy and we hope to learn a lot from this great experience for me and my family. I think that maybe the main topic to talk, to talk right now is focusing on the stress you have when you arrive at an English country. It's an interesting point. You know? Yeah, those are definitely challenges that, that we need to think about more on a, on a global scale. And the students in a similar position can relate to that. And I think that will be really helpful because I interviewed other students at Stanford, but I think that it's nice to have other challenges that people are facing. We're here having coffee and donuts with our friend Jenny, who is a PhD student at Stanford. She actually just defended, so Woo! congratulations, Jenny. Thank you. And now she's on the job hunt and working on finishing up her PhD. And so we thought you'd be an awesome person to ask about, like, reflecting back on your time um, throughout your PhD. Was there a time that you felt your mental health was really diminished? Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be on <laughs> Boom. This is like life goal. <laughs> Um, and yes, I think there are lots of times during the PhD when I struggled 
um, maybe not specifically with mental health per se, but just the struggle of, you know, do I belong here? The whole imposter syndrome thing and, you know, whether or not I was going to finish. It never felt like a guarantee. Yeah. Um, I think the first big struggle I faced was having a project that didn't go the way I wanted it to or the way I expected it to. When I first got here, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I was told, like, meet with some grad students, figure out some potential projects, pick the one that most appeals to you and go for it. Yeah. And that's what I did. I picked the one that I thought sounded the most interesting and that I thought would have the most impact potentially with the minim minimal amount of work. <laughs> and, and I tried it and I actually got results that I was not confident in. And it was hard because in order to try and confirm that my results were correct, I tried to test the same hypothesis using a slightly different method, and I actually got opposite results. Oh, wow. So it was one of those things where not only do I, am I not confident in my results, but the results seem to be entirely dependent on the type of method I was using. Yeah. And I didn't know what to do about it because I just didn't have enough understanding of the problem and the methods I was using to try and solve that problem to figure out which answer is right and what to do about the answers being inconsistent. Because I feel like even worse than getting a result you may not have the most confidence in is when you try something different ways and get exactly opposite results Yeah. without some understanding of which result is the right one. Yeah. And you know, I, right around that time, I decided that maybe the research topic I was working with wasn't the topic I wanted to actually study. Yeah. And, you know, I wrote a fellowship proposal towards a different project that I was way more excited about, and I was lucky enough to get it. So I was really excited because I was like, okay, I'm going to change my focus and work on this new project, but my advisor kept pushing a little bit to be like, are you sure you want to give up this old project? You've yeah. been working on it for, at this point, it was like a couple of years where I'd tried a bunch of debugging to okay. figure out which the right so answer was. So you're in was. like your second, third year? This was point? around my second, third year, okay. probably like beginning to mid third year. Okay. I was also trying to pass my qualifying exams at the time, yeah. which added a different level of stress, especially, you know, you with qualifying exams, you're supposed to report on the research you've done right. and defend the research you've done. And so I knew I was only going to present one of my methods and try and justify my results and explain my results. But at the same mm -hmm. time, it was this question of, okay, well, if I don't tell them I tried this other method and got other results. So that led to, that also contributed to imposter syndrome of like, I don't belong here. I don't know which answer is right. I'm, I'm going on to defend this work and I'm not confident in it. Yeah. Um, but I had this new project I was excited about and my advisor was just like, you can switch to this new project. That's totally fine. We've got the funding to support you for it now, but are you sure you want to give up on this first project? It won't be a part of your thesis if you don't publish on it. There will mm -hmm. be no record of you ever having worked on it, basically, unless yeah. something comes of it. Yeah. And I think it took me a full year and a half before I said to my advisor, like, yes, I'm sure I want to give up on this project. Yeah. But during that time, I felt really lost. I didn't, like I said, I had tried a bunch of debugging. I had tried to talk to a bunch of other people in the lab that had more expertise than me to figure out what I could do to figure out why these results weren't consistent. Mm -hmm. And I tried to do everything they said, and I wasn't getting better answers. And, you know, so it was the combination of like, starting this new project where I had no knowledge and there was almost nobody in the lab who had expertise on this new project. And then trying to finish up this other project where other people had a lot of expertise but couldn't tell me what was going on. Yeah. And so during that time, especially when all of my cohort was successful, like successfully publishing papers mm -hmm. and, you know, moving on to their second projects with successful results from their first project. There was just a lot of stress and anxiety and 
just this feeling of being lost and not belonging. Yeah. And that was really hard to deal with. And I think that there were too many afternoons where I felt paralyzed. Like I didn't know what my next step was. And so I just didn't get any work done. Yeah. And I feel like that feeling of not knowing what to do and then not getting any work done. And then you have to meet with your advisor. And when they ask you, what have you been doing? And the answer is, I don't know, is yeah. just horrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And really hard for having confidence in staying in the PhD program. How long did it take you to get out of that? And, and what helped with that? Um, I think I finally got out of it when I said, yes, I'm giving up on this old project and I'm going to okay. throw myself into the new project and I'm yeah. going to forget about the old one. I'm just going to read all of the literature, solidify my plan yeah. and start working hardcore on this new project. Yeah. Um, I think what got me there was just this feeling of like, I just couldn't do it anymore. Like I couldn't try and straddle these two projects anymore mm-hmm. and it wasn't getting me anywhere. Um, there were lots of things, for example, that I feel like I should talk about that didn't help. Yeah. So, you know, I had a lot of good friends and good mentors that were supportive and were there to listen. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things I don't respond well to is like negative reinforcement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and I think that some people do respond really well to that, to like, yeah. you know, the like, oh, you have, you have to get this done. And if you don't get this done, like I'm going to yell at you. And that never came from my advisor. It came from like, you know, other people in the lab that were trying to motivate me, but that didn't work. So if people were like, oh, if I see you not working on your computer, I'm going to call you out. And I was like, that's not helpful for me. Yeah. That makes me feel worse. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I think that there are people who are like, yes, that's what I need. Like, I need Mm -hmm. someone to be like, why aren't you on task? Like, I see you're not on task. Um, I think sometimes there's a reason that you're not, though. Yeah. That's more than that. And and I feel like, yeah, some people can can respond to that. But others, I feel like when that's what I'm doing, it's because, because, yeah, you're feeling paralyzed. You're feeling really overwhelmed with things. So then it often ends up with the opposite effect. Right. Where you're like, okay, well, this doesn't seem to be working. So I'm going to take a mental health break and check out the news or check out Facebook or message (laughs) my friends. But like it is it isn't going to be beneficial for you if that's what you do the entire time and never actually try to get back to work. Right. But the negative reinforcement didn't work well for me. Another thing that didn't necessarily work was talking to friends and having them be like, yeah, that sounds hard or like a lot of times your friends are trying to be supportive and they're trying to offer advice and sometimes advice isn't what you need. Yeah. yeah. Um, like Were these like friends in lab or friends outside or both? Both, okay. both. Where people are like, oh yeah, that's really hard. Like what works for me is, and I feel like that was helpful in the beginning stages when yeah. I was just starting to like feel lost and not sure what to do. But by the time you've been lost for several months, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, but if those like, things worked for me, like I would be out of this now. Yeah. Like people have things like, oh, you know, what I found worked is, you know, 50 minutes of trying to work and then a 10 minute mental health break. And I think that is really, really useful if you're just struggling with productivity. Yeah. Um, There are these tricks that are really helpful, but I feel like when you're in that feeling of lost and paralyzed, like those tricks aren't what's going to help. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Like you just need something to change. Yeah. And it's not just about your work ethic at that point. Right. Um, Things that I think did help were my friends just listening to me. Mm -hmm. Like just um, being like, so how was your day today? Like, are there things I can do to help? Like just offering to help. And it's not like you can even take them up on the (laughs) offer when the problem is I'm not being productive. Mm -hmm. But that was always helpful to have friends be like, well, tell me what's stressing you out. Let's talk about what's stressing you out. Like, yeah. And then even just like the brainstorming with the person instead of just offering advice mm-hmm. was always really helpful. So like, yeah. oh, so like what you're telling me is that you're having trouble with like doing something. Have you thought about just trying to read a couple papers a day? Like, does that work for you? And then if I was mm-hmm. like, oh, 
you know, that, that doesn't really work for me. And they were like, okay, that's fine. What if you tried doing this today? Yeah. You know, like that back and mm-hmm. forth and having the conversation. Not just always talking at you. Right. Not just throwing like yeah. advice and being like, well, this is what works for me and it should work for you too. Yeah. 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 But the like back and forth of like, have you tried this? Oh, you have, have you tried this? Like, like, have you tried, you know, going for a walk to talk about brainstorming how mm-hmm. you're going to collect data for your new project instead of just sitting at your desk with an open word document that's completely blank <laughs> and not knowing yeah. where to start. Yeah. Um, so I think it's just like the dialogue and having people check in regularly was always really helpful to be mm-hmm. like, you know, you told me you were having this problem last week. I just wanted to see mm-hmm. how you're doing this week. Do you feel like mm-hmm. things are getting better? Is there more that I can do for you? Like the other thing that I think is really hard is the suggestion to go to your advisor when you're in this state of paralysis. Yeah. Because your advisor is there to help you. Mm-hmm. But it's so intimidating to go up to someone you look up to and who you want to have like pos- a positive image of you mm-hmm. and – be like, so I've gotten nothing done in the past few months. What should I do? Yeah, That just feels like, like, I feel like by the time I got to the point where I should have, like, where I realized I should talk to my advisor about being stuck, mm-hmm. like, it, it felt like too late. Like, I'd already wasted so much time mm-hmm. not getting things done that it was too intimidating to be yeah. like, it's been three months and I have not gotten any work accomplished. It's helpful to hear validation sort of of all those thoughts. I have definitely had those feelings or those feelings of paralysis. And it's like scary because you just don't yeah. know what to do. And you just feel like no one else really understands it. Yeah, it's I think that's one of the hardest parts of a PhD is even if you get to work on a team project, your PhD is yours alone and you have to take ownership of it. Mm-hmm. So the PhD is really independent and you're the one that's held accountable for how much progress you make. So when something happens and your progress gets stalled, it feels like it's your fault and it's your problem. And it's up to you to figure out how to get unstuck, especially if you don't have an advisor that tries to micromanage your project. Mm -hmm. There are lots of advisors that are more hands-off because they want you to learn how to be an independent researcher. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but when you get stuck, when you feel paralyzed, there's nobody to shake you out of it. Definitely. I feel like I struggle a lot too with, you know, when you have classes and other things you can work on, I'll just resort to that. And I'll be like, well, I know that this homework is due for class, so I can do that. I can work on the podcast. I can work on other things. And then it's hard to find the motivation to try to work on your project when you don't really know what you're supposed to be doing. And then another quarter goes by and you're like, all right, I didn't make any progress well, again. <laughs> well, the other thing is that you get like really good feedback, yeah. right? Like, mm-hmm. like, and, if, and feelings of accomplishment, right? Like you have to set those milestones when it comes to research because mm-hmm. you're never like, oh, I ran that one experiment, pat on the back. Like nobody's yeah. going to pat you on the back but yourself. Yeah. Whereas when you finish a homework, you're like, it's done. Yeah. And I get, yeah. I turn it into a teacher and it gets graded. Yeah. And now I know yeah, I did exactly. well on this homework. Yeah. And I feel like it's really easy to get stuck in that, especially when the PhD programs start really class heavy, because it kind of feels like you can just do this nice transition from undergrad where all that really matters is your grades Mm -hmm. to, oh, I'm in grad school. All that really matters is my grades. And then you're like thrown into, like you're done with classes. You've got to work on your research project. And you're like, wait, but where's my positive reinforcement? Where's (laughs) my pats on the back? Where are the people saying this is your goal for this week and it's due by this date? Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely think that's real. Um, I don't know if this should go in the podcast, honestly, but one of the things that also was really helpful to me in a horrifying kind of way was when I had a meeting with my advisor and he goes, look, I know that you've been struggling to be productive and I'm not blaming you. I'm not saying it's your fault, but are you sure you want to stay in the PhD program? I was definitely emotional in that meeting. I definitely cried in that meeting. It definitely felt like failure. Yeah. Um, And that's not what he was trying to say. That wasn't at all what he was getting at, but it was just a, like, let's check in. Yeah. If this isn't what you want to do, if the reason why you're not being productive is because this isn't what you want to do, mm-hmm. like, 
I'm not going to make you, I'm not going to force you to stay in this program. Yeah. Like take a long, hard look at like what it actually is you want, Mm -hmm. what you're enjoying and not enjoying. And like, let's not torture you for the next like several years while we try and get this done. Yeah. And I think it really forced me to take a long, hard look. And honestly, I couldn't tell you if like, I think, like, I I did take that long, hard look. I did still think I wanted to get my PhD. But I I honestly, like, now that I'm near the finish and getting to the end, I can't tell you for sure if, like, part of what motivated me was the challenge of, are you sure you want your PhD? Like, are you sure this is what you want? And me being, like, challenge accepted. <laughs> or if it was, like yes, I do need the PhD to accomplish my goals. Yeah. I think that it it just kind of like scared me into this, like, you know, I really can spend years and years and years being unproductive and still being in a PhD program. Like my advisor asked mm-hmm. me this while I still had funding. He had nothing on the line to ask me aside from like trying to check in with my mental health. Yeah. And I'm just so glad he did. And it was, like I said, at the time it was horrifying it was really startling to be like oh look my advisor does realize I'm struggling like Mm -hmm. he does recognize that it's not like I thought I was shielding him from it but clearly I wasn't doing a good enough job but I think that I you know we had that conversation and I think it was around the same time that I was like you know what I think what would really make me happy and help me to be successful is if I drop this other project yeah like I'm ready to drop Mm -hmm. this other project I'm ready to be productive and go all in on this new project that I'm way more excited about and that I think will have solid outcomes that I'll understand. Right. I think it is really useful to have a good advisor who, even if he's hands off, is really in tune with what's going on with his students. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jenny, for sharing all that. And it's kind of, I won't say funny is the wrong word, but for lack of a different word, um, what kind of motivates you sometimes at the end of the day and yeah. like it's it's little things like that that I think that like you think I think sometimes I think like oh I'm going to be so motivated by like some patient experience that's going to like push me to like do this thing to be better but at the end of the day maybe it's just I'm motivated because yeah someone is challenging <laughs> like can you do it or, or something like that so yeah and I think that the most important thing that I learned from my PhD and that I would say to other people who are in the PhD program or considering a PhD program is just like a PhD is a choice. And at any time, you're totally free to walk away and do something else and keep that in mind while you're struggling. And I'm not saying that as soon as it gets hard, walk away, but really remember why you're in it and use that to help drive you and motivate you. That's really great advice. Thank you, Jenny. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to this special episode. We really appreciate our friends that took the time to talk to us about some of the challenges that we face in grad school, and we hope that maybe you can use some of the tools that they learned in your life in grad school. And as we mentioned before, um, if you need help, uh, please do reach out to a friend. Or any of the services that are available at your university or in your area, they exist there's even a a hotline called crisis text line that you can text just with anything if you just need to talk and there are volunteers working 24 7 there biomechanics on our minds is brought to you by the international society of biomechanics and special thank you to peter washington for all the music that he does for all of our episodes (laughs) um we didn't have all of the music that we usually have in this one but we always appreciate all the fun tracks that he has provided for us Tune in next time for more biomechanics, and until then, we'll keep mental health on our minds and hope that you'll do the same. Boom!